want to welcome all of you to the Stuart Heritage Meeting. I'd like to welcome Mr. Whitman. And who's the other journalist? Steve Carr. Mr. Carr. Okay, Steve Carr. And we're going to let them go without much ado to the program. I'm going to turn it without further ado over to Mr. Whitman. Alice knows a lot more about Mr. Whitman than I do. Uh, Alice, you feel like coming up and introducing? Well, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. um, and he'll tell you uh, all about uh, how they, what they do down in Jupiter and how they're involved with the Seminole Wars. Thank you all for coming. Good evening. Um, can you hear me? My name is Jeff Whitman. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm very grateful. Um, the last time I had to speak before this many people was in front of the county commission, and I don't really enjoy doing that. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this. Um, I'm here with my partner, Steve Carr. Um, we've been hunting battlefields for probably the last 30 years almost. And um, the Stuart News said that the promo for the um, plan tonight, that um, I was an expert on the Seminole Wars. Um, I am not an expert. Uh, Steve, Carr, Steve Carr is the expert. Um, I'll defer to him any, any questions that I can't answer. Um, he's much more knowledgeable than I am. But um, Anyhow, let me tell you a little bit of history about what happened. Um, <coughs> the Loxahatchee Battlefield was almost um, never found. It was never preserved. There was a plan not to preserve it. Um, the, uh, and I'm going to say this off the record, it's uh, just my opinion, but uh, there were several people in Palm Beach County that did not want any word of the battlefield um, coming out to the public. And there were a couple of reasons for that. And um, basically, Steve Carr, there were three people that found the battle site uh, Steve Carr, Kevin Randall, and myself, it was uh, April of 1991. And the politicians and the people, the developers down in Palm Beach County did not want any word of the battle site coming out for the public to know about it. One of the county commissioners, I'm not gonna tell you which one it was, but um, he wanted to turn it into a golf course. <laughs> um, it's about 600, it's about a section, it's about 640 acres, maybe a little bit more. And, um, <clears throat> The other problem was with uh, the developers were running rampant down there and they were controlling the uh, county commission and um, they were trying to build wide and Indian Town Road, make it into a four lane road and straighten it out. And they did not want any word of the battlefield coming out because um, that would, they'd have to do archaeological surveys and it would slow everything down. The developers, and they had huge tracts of land on the north side of Indian Town. They wanted to do this huge development there. And since then, the property in Cypress Creek has been preserved. It's a natural area. But at the time, I'm not going to tell you the developer, because he's actually turned out to be a really good guy. But um, all that land's been bought by the state and preserved. So, it's, um, But at the time, they were trying to meet concurrency for uh, the state. The state had more environmental regulations in place. And they did not want anybody talking about the battlefield, because there are actually seven federal soldiers that are buried out there. And they don't know where they're buried. And for a long time, um, people just didn't know where the battlefield was. When I was a kid, there was a marker in Jonathan Dickinson where you rent the canoes. And it said this near here was where the, uh, the battle, battle was fought. And um, it was, actually, it was, it was about seven miles away from where the, the state put the marker. But um, the thing that messed everybody up was in Mott's book, Jacob Red Mott, Jacob Rett Mott, um, he fought, he was there, he was there at the Battle of Loxahatchee. And he wrote, he, he wrote the book, um, the, um, Steve, what's the name of the book? Help me out. Uh, Into the Wilderness. Into the Wilderness by Rick, Jacob Red Mott. And um, he said in the book that they crossed over the river. I'm just doing the Jeopardy thing. <laughs> <laughs> They, uh, they crossed from the north to the <coughs> south in the battle, and they said that the river was um, 30 yards wide. <coughs> and the only place that the river is really 30 yards wide where you can cross from the north to the south was right there at, um, where you read the canoes of Jonathan Dickinson. And Kevin and I, Kevin and I had been hunting the battle for about 
10 years, we, we have trouble finding. We, we, the river, Loxahatchee, the name of it is the Turtle River. Um, as the crow flies, it's only three miles from, the, from about the inlet to where River Bend Park is, maybe four miles. But literally, it's, it's um, 14 or 15 miles. And, and Kevin and I went over the whole, pretty much the whole river with metal detectors and couldn't find anything. And um, let, me, let me get into a little bit of the history here. Um, the second, there were three Seminole Wars. Um, we're talking about the second Seminole War, and I'm going to give, just give you a little, oh, yeah. The thing that, that got me interested in finding the battle site was that in the early 1980s, 1980, 1981, I was part of the Dubois family. And um, I know you heard of Bessie Dubois, the Dubois House, Dubois Park, Dubois Road. That was all the Dubois family. They were one of the first pioneers in Jupiter. And I was dating Bessie's granddaughter, who happened to live with Bessie, right there where, where the uh, Dubois house is. And Bessie made her living um, as a cook. They had a restaurant there, right there in the Jupiter Inlet. And I would go over to the house every night, and she would cook me like a three, four course meal. And I would get to hear all the old stories about Jupiter from uh, John and Bessie. And they had a map in the, the living room there, and it's a big map, probably four feet by four feet. It was the Ives map from 1856, 1857. Actually, it was from the map from the uh, third Seminole War. But Bessie knew um, Billy Bowlegs III. He used to come and stay with her. That's how close they were. But the, the map had the battle site on, on the map, on the Loxahatchee. And I said, Bessie, John, where's, do you know where the battle site? Battle side of this. They said, no. They said it was where the Seminoles um, crossed the river with their cattle. And they said uh, that um, Trapper knew where it was, but they didn't know. They, didn't, they had no idea where it was. They just knew it was somewhere out west of uh, Jupiter. So that's pretty much got me interested in it. And like I said, Kevin and I looked for it for about 10 years. And then we brought in Steve. And Steve and I. The first day I brought Steve with us, um, we found him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm just going to give you a run through a little bit of the history. Um, the second, well, it, it's a very, very complicated story. And um, it comes down to um, the slavery and the, uh, what was happening was that the slaves were running away from the plantations in Georgia and South Carolina and Alabama. And they're coming down into the, uh, the Creek Nation. It's actually the, uh, the Creeks and the Miccosukees, collectively called the Seminoles. And the, the runaway slaves are coming down into Florida and becoming part of the tribes. And um, that created a problem for the plantation owners because they would send the slave catchers after them and chase them down. It caused all sorts of conflict with the, uh, the Seminoles and the white people also because the white people were starting to push down. So the second Seminole Indian War started um, really December 28, 1835, um, with the murder, murder of the Indian agent Wiley Thompson, and the day the day massacre was over by uh, Tampa. And um, let me read the notes here. Um, that's that really started the uh, the war right there. It's, um, Osceola was the one that murdered uh, Wiley Thompson at Fort King. And from there, everything just got worse. Um, I'm going to jump to um, 1837 and uh, talk about Major, uh, Major General um, Thomas Jessup. Um, he was put in command, and he was, um, had four columns that were pushing down the state, <clears throat> pushing the Seminoles further south. And he had four columns. There was General Taylor, I'm sorry, Colonel Taylor, who later became general after the Battle of Okeechobee. General Hernandez, General Eustace, and uh, General Jessup, and they had these four columns coming down. Was, they probably had about um, 2,000 men, maybe a little bit more. And they pushed all the Seminoles down to the um, north bank of Lake Okeechobee. And that's where General Taylor ran into them, and they had the Battle of Okeechobee. Um, that was uh, December, December 25th, Christmas, Christmas 1830, 1837. 
And that set the stage for the, uh, the Battle of Loxahatchee. Because at the Battle of Okeechobee, um, the, uh, Jessup was not involved in that battle at all. It was only um, Colonel, Colonel Taylor's um, people, soldiers. And, um, That battle resulted in um, 26 men killed and 111 wounded. And um, I don't know if any of you know John Durham, but John Durham was the one that found the battle site. Um, it was, uh, he did the research, he found the battle site. And um, there was a conflict there with the Seminoles because um, there was Alligator and there was um, Kokuchi Wildcat and there was Sam Jones. Sam Jones was a Miccosukee. And they decided in the heat of the battle, Steve and I, we dug musket balls there. It was pressed right up against 441, where 441 is now. You've got to remember, the, uh, the lake came, came further up. They, they didn't have the rim canal. It came right up to where the Cypress Ridge is. And it had a white sand beach. And Sam Jones, Apica, that's what the Seminoles call him, um, he took his people south and went down to um, probably the mound in um, in um, Wellington, the big listen mound, put his people down there, and then they, they went further down to Pine Island, um, <coughs> San Jones Island, which is um, west of Fort Lauderdale. And that really saved the uh, Seminole tribe, um, because what happened was the other ones came into the, the other group faction, uh, Wildcat and Alligator, came into uh, the Loxahatchee. And they, they had a camp uh, village there right on where Riverbend Park is now. And um, unfortunately, they, after the battle, um, most of them gave themselves up and they were sent out to the uh, Arkansas Territory, the Indian Territory. So really, the only Seminoles that remained in the state were the uh, Miccosukees under Sam Jones. But, um, <coughs> Uh, so, so they had the Battle of Okeechobee, Christmas Day, 1837, and then they had uh, another battle, Powell's Battle, was um, on the east, east side of Loxahatchee, and that was in um, January 14, 1837. And there were a bunch of soldiers and sailors got killed in that battle. And um, they had, um, then the 24th, Jessup heard about Powell's Battle, and I don't know whether he heard about the Okeechobee battle or not, but he sent his forces down and he came out. He left from Fort Pierce and he went out to Fort Lloyd. He had, um, let me get this right here, he had 600 dragoons, 400 artillerymen, um, 500 Alabama and Tennessee volunteers, and 35 Delaware Indians. And he came right up the uh, Van Swearington Trail, which went from Fort Lloyd, which is out, it's out, Fort Lloyd is on the um, Red Lodge and Dairy on Okeechobee. It's, uh, and they had to go out, they had to go straight west from Fort Pierce, and they went to um, uh, Fort Lloyd, and they met up with uh, General Eustace was hit with his men, and that's where they got the 1,500 troops. And then they had to bypass the headwaters of the St. Lucie, and then they had to bypass the uh, headwaters of the Loxahatchee. And they came right down, this is how we found it, was they came, they came right down Indian Town, the old Indian Town Road, Indian Town Trail. And since then, in the new Indian Town is a little bit further south of the old Indian Town Trail, but the old Indian Town Trail was part of the Van Swearton Trail, which was an Indian trail. And um, it led right into um, the Loxahatchee. <coughs> now, when you get to the Battle of Loxahatchee, um, there's a, a hammock there that runs all north and south of the, the river. And if you go down Taylor Road, you go down to the Shunk property, then you go to a Five Acre Orange Road, then you go to the Blankenship property, and um, that whole hammock, um, where there are Seminoles lived in the whole hammock, and we were finding musket balls and stuff in, the, um, in that area. and. Um, the hammock actually goes all the way up to Martin County. And the other thing was um, why I say that the battle really started in Martin County was that um, there's a hammock. All that, all that land is underwater. 
And um, they would have to go, the Seminoles would pretty much go by dugout canoes. And there was a hammock out on Matt Gary Road, which I know was an Indian village, a small Indian village. And they probably had a sentry out there. And the sentry gave word to the, the Seminoles at the camp, the village at Riverbend, that the uh, soldiers were coming. And the Battle of Loxahatchee was a strictly a defensive battle. It was only fought to get the people um, away from the, uh, the soldiers. It was just a delaying tactic. And they had about four hours time because the dragoons, um, 500 dragoons got fired on when they first um, approached the hammock. And um, we, um, and then it took a couple more hours for the rest of the troops to um, come down the uh, Banks Road to trail of the old Indian Town Road. And they met um, intense fire from the Indians. And the Indians knew they were coming because the Indians had time to notch the trees and um, cut down to clear the sawgrass so they had an open, open field to shoot at the soldiers. And the soldiers really had a tough time. And um, they, uh, the, sol uh, the soldiers were under a lot of fire. And um, I've got it written down how many were killed. Anyway, the county did not want any word of this to come out because, like I said, they wanted to get into currency. They didn't want the battle, the, the grave, the, the body of soldiers' bodies to be found. Um, we came right down, the battle came right down Indian Town Road, and that's where we pretty much found um, the grape shot and the musket balls. And we have a lot of the stuff from the battle here, um, just so you can see. Um, here's a Congreve rocket right here. They were shooting off the Congreve rockets, mainly just to scare the Indians. But um, let me get some figures for you, and I'll tell you how many soldiers were killed. They did a they did an archaeological study and, um, in 1994, and we were mentioned it several times. Um, they gave us credit for it. Then, a few years later, here's the survey right here. It's, it's over 200 pages, um, and we're mentioned it several times as helping find the battle. Um, then they, they redid it. This is about 100 pages here, and they completely cut us out. <laughs> yeah, which, you know, the most important thing was that the, battle, the battlefield was preserved. And they still haven't found the uh, soldiers' bodies. But um, if you go there to the park, um, they kind of got, got things mixed up. And mainly because of the, the people that are doing the tours and stuff weren't there. They weren't involved in um, finding the battle. And they say that the soldiers came up from the south, and they said that there's a tree there, and that's the tree of, te tree of tears where all the soldiers were buried. And that's all cool. Um, <laughs> the big tree, the big tree has a septic tank right next to it. <laughs> it's a great big oak tree, but that's where they put the septic tank. Now, now Mott said that when they crossed, they crossed over the, the river from the north to the south. Um, then they. The Indians dispersed. They, they got the hell out of there. And they had enough time. They probably had, from the battle probably started about noon, went all the way to almost dark, probably 7 o'clock. And um, when Ma and the soldiers were able to um, get across the river, they found the dead soldiers from Powell's Battle, which was a couple, a couple weeks earlier. Then they crossed the back across the river, and they buried the soldiers on the north side of the river, the northwest side of the river. So. Anybody that says the soldiers were buried south of the river, southeast of the river, they're just wrong. Um, they read Mott's journal, Journey of the Wilderness. Um, let me just get my thoughts together here. Um, this, Jessup, Jessup was uh, leading the charge. And, um, Journey of the Wilderness, you should all read that book because it's fascinating. But General Jessup was leading the charge, and um, he um, turned around and looked, and there was nobody behind him. He was, he was there all by himself. <laughs> and the, the, the fire was too hot that the Tennessee Volunteers and the rest of the regulars <coughs> didn't follow him. And at that moment, he got hit by a musket ball, and it, it didn't run in the cheek, and it broke his glasses. And one of the things that I wanted to let you know is uh, the Seminoles, um, they had better guns. They had, uh, they had English 
and Spanish rifles were the uh, federal troops. The main, the main gun they had was a, a musket, 69 caliber musket. And uh, these were very accurate. The rifles were much more accurate. But the Indians kept the, uh, the balls, the lead balls in their mouth. And they would pour the uh, powder down the, the muzzle of their, their rifles. And they wouldn't measure the powder. And then they would spit a ball down into the, the barrel and cock it and, and shoot it. They were all flintlocks back then, uh, pretty much. And probably what happened with Jessup was that they, they didn't have measured the powder correctly. And the, uh, the ball didn't have enough charge in it to just, it just glanced. Them. But they were. Um, Long story short, there were seven seven soldiers killed. Um, how many were wounded? Can you help me out? Um, a lot. Well, I can tell. I'll, I'll tell you exactly. Hold on a second. <coughs> um, my, I'm sorry, my computer's down right yeah. now. Yeah. 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 There, there was a there was an extensive amount of wounded from the second battle of uh, Lackawanna. It was Chesapeake battle. Chesapeake. Um, well, let's. We know probably eight to ten of those passed away later at Fort Chicago. Yeah, well, what happened was that seven were buried, seven died right there, and probably about 23 or 29 were wounded. And, and most of those were the Tennessee Volunteers. And uh, so Jessup kind of derided them and said they weren't very brave. But he didn't want to deride them too much because his boss was Andrew Jackson, and he was a Tennessean, so he didn't, he didn't beat them up too bad. But out of all of that, I think there was 27 or 29 that were wounded. 23 were the Tennessee Volunteers, so they, um, they really fought very hard. But the thing is, we still don't know where those soldiers are buried. And we have a theory, there was a great big mound of dirt piled up when, when they were doing the road, by the way. And um, they, we think they might have covered over the, the graves so that nobody would know where the soldiers were buried. I mean, the, the mound was 25, 30 feet high. But, um, it is one of the most beautiful places in Florida. You should all go down there and see it. Um, after the battle, um, they took the wounded and they went to Fort Jupiter. They went to um, Pettit Point. And uh, my friend Bobby Gilbert, he was one of the first. He was him and Kevin Miranda found Fort Jupiter. And I said, "How did you ever find uh, Fort Jupiter?" He said, "Well, I looked at the uh, street map, Palm Beach County street map, and I found an old Fort Jupiter road." And they said they went down there. And just found all sorts of artifacts. Um, one of the art, and we, we dug most of the artifacts mm -hmm. from Fort Jupiter. Um, there really wasn't a lot out of the Battle of Loxahatchee, just with the, uh, it just wasn't. I mean, the most thing, the most of the artifacts we found out there were the musket balls, and Steve found the grave shot. And it's in, it's in the first archaeological survey. The archaeologist that did the survey, his name was Bob Carr, um, no relation to Steve Carr. And he gave Steve Carr the credit for, um, Finding the uh, grave shot, that was the key to proving that it was actually the Battle of Blocks Hatchet. And we have some grave shot here. Um, I have one of them that Steve was kind enough to give me. But Steve was using an old metal detector that would pick up horseshoes and nails. And, it, it, and we had the better metal detectors that would pick up the non ferrous like brass, lead, copper. He was going around digging horseshoes and beer cans. And, and he was digging up the, he was digging up the grave shot, which was iron. And that turned out to be the key to proving that it was the, uh, the battle site. And then so um, we worked with the archaeologists on that. We told them how the battle progressed. We really helped them give them an idea how the battle went on. And um, we got credit in the first archaeological survey, but they never, uh, never gave us any credit in the second archaeological survey, which doesn't really matter, but the main thing is the battlefield did, and they destroyed, they probably destroyed half the battlefield when they put in Indian Town Road, because if you look, it's, it's 300 yards, they, they, they bulldozed everything for 300 yards and straightened the road out and put a new bridge across the locks of Hatchie. But getting back to the battle, after the battle, they went to uh, establish Fort Jupiter, and all the Indians, um, they sent out parties, dragoons, trying to bring them in. They brought some of them in. But after the battle, um, several hundred of the Seminoles came in. I think it was Wildcat came in and went under flag of truce. And they said, we want to surrender. And um, Jessup said, well, come on in. We'll have a parlay. And um, we'll see if we can work it out. So hundreds of the Indians came in. They were literally starving. Um, they didn't have any food. They had 200 head of cattle 
which the soldiers rounded up. They were very prosperous assemblies. They had crops, they had cattle, but the, the, the war made it so hard they kept moving, they had to keep moving and moving and kept being pushed south. And so Jessup had a parley with them and um, they were all behaving. They, were, they said, well, if we want peace, it was the Mekasukis, they said, that actually wanted to press the war. He said, we were, Kokuchi was saying, we didn't really want to fight, you know. And he blamed on the Mekasuki, which really the Mekasuki were much more tougher, uh, un unbelievably tough, and they had more of the black Seminoles, and the black Seminoles were very ferocious <coughs> because they had more to lose than the Seminoles, because the Seminoles already had a territory, the Arkansas Territory, hundreds of thousands of acres out in um, out west, west of the Mississippi, which was their designated reservation. So they already had the land, but the problem was the black Seminoles, the soldiers, the command were taking the blacks, the, the blacks away from the Seminoles, and the blacks had actually become part of the tribe. And that was where the road was. Um, just one more. Oh, yeah. So anyway, so point, um, Jessup wrote a letter to Secretary of War, points it, and said, look, these are good people. Florida is no place for, for any white man to live. He said it's too inhospitable. <laughs> With the rattlesnakes and the mosquitoes, it was just, they were just miserable there. They were all, everybody at the fort was getting sick. And they said, this is just no land. No, no white man want to live here. Just let the Indians stay. They're not going to cause any problems. And Poinsett brought him back uh, a month later and said, no, no, we're pressing the war. You, you, can't, you can't have a truce. So long story short, the uh, Indians got moved, those Indians all got moved out to Fort Brooke and uh, removed, were moved out to uh, the Arkansas Territory, Oklahoma, and it was really sad. I'm, I'm going to say one more thing about the uh, Seminoles, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Um, one of the people, probably my hero, there's, oh, everybody hears about Osceola, and he was tough, and he was captured by Jessup under a uh, flag of truce and imprisoned in uh, Fort San, San Marcos uh, up in St. Augustine. But um, everybody thinks that Osceola is the, the main character. But there was Sam Jones. And Sam Jones was probably, to me, the most fascinating person in the whole Seminole War. Um, he was not a warrior. He was not a chief. He was a medicine man. He was a shaman. And he was almost feared by all the, all the Seminoles, they, they would not go against him. As a matter of fact, when he died, they all came down to see his body because he was so powerful. They said he had the spirit of three men inside him. And uh, he was pretty powerful. As a matter of fact, the Seminoles, when I go down and talk to the uh, Seminoles down in the Big Cypress, they still talk about him directly. And so anyway, um, going back to June, before all these battles took place, Loxahatchee Battle, Battle of Okeechobee, Paddles Battle. Um, June 2nd, Jessup had eight, almost 900 Seminoles rounded up at Fort Brooke, and he had them in a detention camp under guards. And they were ready to put them on steamboats and ship them out to the Indian Territory the next day. And this is before Osceola was captured under the flag of troops. This was June 2nd, 18, 1837. That night, Osceola and Sam Jones came in and took out 800, almost 900 Seminoles from the detention camp for being guarded in a stealth night. Just, just took them. And, and can you imagine moving eight, 900 people from a fort with soldiers? There were probably hundreds of soldiers there guarding. Snuck them all out, and that just killed Jessup's plan. The war, if they hadn't been removed that night, the war would have been over the next day because the Seminoles just could not have pressed the war without those eight, nine hundred Seminoles. So, um, Sam Jones, if you ever, ever read about him, he's a pretty, uh, pretty amazing guy. And now I'm getting tired of talking. Um, I'm going to let Steve take over because Steve was there right there with me. He's my partner. He's been with my partner for almost 30 years. He'll tell you, he'll tell you about some of the artifacts. Can I clear that up? Treasure hunting partner? Yes. This day and age, we have to be specific about something. Not there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jeff. Um, you did a pretty good job. Um, and 
like he said, we've known each other for 30 years, so I'm just amazed that he had this epiphany of memory tonight that was uh, blew me away. Um, I would like to, uh, I just want to let you know, I know those chairs are hard, and uh, so I'm going to limit myself to the, I'm not going to go over the three hour window that they gave me to see. So, <laughs> just I'm looking out for you. Almost didn't come up here tonight after I read the article uh, about uh, what happened at the Stewart Police Station uh, last night. I don't know how many of you read that, but it was uh, kind of interesting that someone broke into the Stewart Police Station and stole all the toilet seats. <laughs> the bottom line, the bottom line is uh, not only do they not have a suspect, but as of right now, they have absolutely nothing to go on. <laughs> My only joke, so let's let that uh, stir around a little bit. Um, the reason I'm here is that this story is, is it, as Jeff said earlier, he alluded to the complexity of the story. The story is much more um, than what it appears to be um, on the outside. There were so many factions, there were so many um, moving parts to the story that it's hard to stand up here and do a program that does justice to it because there's just so much going on here. Um, let me ask you a question, and I like to get my audiences engaged in what I'm doing. I don't like to just stand up here and preach to you. Um, I like to get you engaged. So I'm gonna, by a raising of the hands, how many of you in this room um, have heard the name Spartacus? <laughs> Spartacus, okay, Every, almost everybody in here. Spartacus was the leader of an insurrection of slaves in the Roman era, and um, he is known throughout history um, for this great attempt and, and admired for his attempt to free slaves, to, to give men their freedom. Um, now, this, let's throw out two other names and let's see how well this goes over. Abraham and John Cavallo. How many have heard those names? Oh, okay. I see two. Three, make three hands coming up. Abraham and John Kavai. Why their names are important is they were the first leaders of an insurrection that aimed to free African Americans from servitude in America. Um, when they came into, they were escaped escaped from plantations when they came into North Florida. They were given a special status by the Seminoles because of not only knowledge, um, uh, Abraham was incredible, uh, incredibly smart person. He had, uh, he was, um, spoke several different languages. Um, John Caballo was a uh, born leader. They were both African Americans and they were both um, on the same page that something had to be done to lead a, uh, or to create an opportunity for African Americans to exit out of slavery. And isn't it interesting that they're probably the most uh, notable members of the, of, of the uh, African American community that began slave, the thought of, of changing the way America looks at, at, at slavery. Um, they were instrumental in giving their people hope. And I think what's amazing about all of this is it happened right here in Florida. It happened in our state. Um, the sad thing is we haven't done a really good job with our history here. Um, in other states, it doesn't matter where you go throughout the, the country, um, they showcase their history. But in Florida, we seem to have, and I think many of you who are history-oriented people, would agree with me that we've done probably the poorest of jobs of showcasing um, our history. And, and so this is why I come out and that is to kind of correct that and to kind of put um, history back into the ears of people and get people talking about it because history is what connects us to our environment. And uh, if we lose that connection, then we lose caring about our environment caring about where we live. Um, I am not a treasure hunter. And I've been portrayed as a treasure hunter. 
um, for a long time. Uh, I'm a history hunter, and my job in the early days was to prove that history existed. The Loxahatchee Battlefield, for one, of the many places that I have worked on um, and many places where I have recovered artifacts, I've never sold an artifact in my life. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've donated more artifacts than I, I, um, I've, I've kept. So with that said, I want you to understand what, our, what Jeff and I were up against back in the 80s when we were trying to uncover the battlefield, of the Loxahatchee battlefield. And what didn't get said tonight was there were actually two battles that incorporate the Loxahatchee battlefield. Uh, Powell's battle, um, uh, Lieutenant uh, Levin S. Powell, who brought a group of sailors and soldiers into that same area of the Loxahatchee on a mission. He was on a scouting mission to try to locate the Indians, determine their number, and then report back to General Jessup, who was uh, at Fort Pierce. Um, in that battle, uh, it was an extremely um, uh, uh, aggressive battle and nearly a massacre. Um, that was fought January 15th, 1838. <clears throat> Help me, my brain may be slipping. January 14th. January 15th, I think it was. Um, with that said, um, uh, on January 24th, uh, let me back up and say that uh, after that battle, the numbers of Seminoles were determined, their location was, was determined, that information got back to Fort Pierce. Um, General Jessup then put a plan in motion to march his men through the interior of Florida, come around the backside of the Loxahatchee to surprise the Seminoles, and that was fought on January 24th, 1838. So with that said, we have two battles that were actually fought on the same piece of property, or in the same, same area. Uh, going back to why it was so important for us to find the battlefield, um, I, have, I was born and raised here. I have a connection to this area. Um, I left to go into the Army for four years. I came back, um, went to work for mm -hmm. Columbus County Fire Rescue as a paramedic. Um, and I had, when you work as a firefighter paramedic, you have one day on, 24 hours in, and you have two days off. My two days off, I was nothing but history. I wanted to learn history. Um, I had grown to a point in my life where I just wanted to understand better where I grew up. This, the problem that I was facing with that is that the development was rampant. There was just unchecked development. And, and I know you're all familiar with that and how that works. Um, but we did not have a historic preservation officer in Palm Beach County. We didn't have an archeologist assigned to the county to protect its historical resources. Um, as a matter of fact, they just didn't care. Um, there was really very few people that actually cared about history. And that bothered me. Um, I was, on my days off, I was actually teaching. Um, I worked in the uh, Loxahatchee Historical Society in their summer camp, I would teach um, teach Florida history. This is back in the 80s. And I remember uh, having a conversation with a gentleman who everybody told me was the most knowledgeable about the, um, the area, including the Loxahatchee Battle. And my conversation with him went something like this. Where's the Loxahatchee Battle for? I don't know. I don't know. That bothered me. Um, it wasn't long after I got an interest in the Loxahatchee Battlefield, I started meeting people and asking questions. And I had the great fortune uh, to meet my good friend Jeff Whitman um, at a military history show. And we talked about it. It seems like we talked for hours. Uh, we had like mind in, in, uh, in, in, in not only hunting for history, but preservation of history. And our job really um, was to, we decided, and I, I didn't know that Jeff was already, Jeff is, he keeps things close to the vest there. And I didn't know he was already looking for the Loxahatchee battlefield. So when I'm having this long conversation and telling him all about this lost battlefield, he was just nodding his head, yeah, 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 I've heard about it. Turns out for the last 10, for the 10 years prior, he was actively looking for the battlefield. He was, they were hiring airplanes and going up and following the Loxahatchee. They were in neck deep in the Loxahatchee in gator holes. Uh, trying to turn up artifacts to prove that the state was wrong about the location. The state had located it in Jonathan Dickinson State Park. Uh, and Jeff knew that wasn't right. 
Um, we had we had a lot of things going against us. Number one was the time factor, development, um, and I think the most pressing issue was that the county did, as Jeff said, and I'm going to back that up 100%. The county didn't want this family. As a matter of fact, the property that the battlefield turned out to be on was um, it was posted no trespassing, very poorly posted because I never saw those signs the first 26 times I went in. There. <laughs> but the problem, what we had to accomplish was, was it there or wasn't it there? And one of the things Jeff, I think Jeff was the first one, Jeff and Kevin Moranville with Bobby Gilbert um, flying the airplane, they noticed uh, in Mott's, we're going to refer back to, to Mott's book, and Mott's book was the key to unlocking this battlefield. It was all in the book. And it was just how you read the book that, that was the, lot of the key that unlocked the mystery of where the battlefield was. Because in Mott's journal, he says, we crossed the river from the north side to the south side. And that was key because on the Loxahatchee River, it flows mainly north and south. It does now because it's been channelized, it's been reworked, it's been, much has been done by, um, by the uh, growers, the fruit growers over the years um, to change the direction of the river. But what Jeff saw was he found a place uh, just south of Indian Town Road. I believe they spotted it by air the first time. And on this place, they could see the old um, water hickories, the giant cypress, and they could see how those giant cypress trees from the air went, were going um, in a north-south direction, but then they made a 90-degree turn and went um, to back to the east. The problem was there wasn't any really much water there. It was, it was all dried up in there. And the answer to that mystery was work in the back area of the Loxahatchee Slough had dried up the original river. So the original banks of the river were still there. It's just the water had been redirected um, to a new location where it sits today. Um, and uh, that was in the Reese Groves. Uh, it comes down the center of the Reese Groves. But back in the old days, it came out of the Loxahatchee Slough. Jeff saw these trees and he said, if those trees are there, and they whined like that, there had to have been a river there. And so after having several conversations with Jeff, one day he called me up and he said, I think we know where the battlefield is. Do you want to come? <laughs> it's like, I'm on my way, you know. Uh, I'm on my way. I'll meet you there. And uh, I had looked for a long time with no luck. Jeff had found a lot of artifacts um, that were related to the Second Seminole War, but nothing that was definitive and nothing in that area. We found them all over the place because the, really the soldiers were marching up and down. They're all they're camping all through there, so it wasn't unlikely that we were going to find artifacts. But nothing in that connected us to the battle. Uh, but on that day that Jeff called, um, he called me. This is my first time working with him. And um, I, I got up there and we walked across the old wooden bridge and I'm looking at this place and I'm thinking, he's gotta be kidding me. It can't be here. There's no, there's no water here. There's no river here. It was, almost, it was almost completely dry. I could walk across it. I said, you think the battle is fought here? Within five minutes, Jeff had <coughs> recovered a musket ball and Kevin Moranville had recovered a musket ball. What had happened is the county had just removed the exotic plants out from the old section of the river, and um, they'd taken a lot of a lot of exotic plants out there. So it was a great opportunity for us to get in there and work. As we followed the old riverbank, we found more and more and more musket balls, and um, we got to a section when we came close to the um, the Indian Town Road bridge. Then we found many musket balls, and we were getting pretty excited by that point. Um, some sub subsequent visits after that started producing more definitive um, artifacts. I have a couple of letters here, um, but I, I, before I read this, I just want to tell you that um, even though we, we did remove artifacts, we did so 
so that we would have a case against the county if for some reason the county said, that's not the battlefield. You know, we documented everything we took out. Uh, and then uh, another point I want to make is we didn't take everything. I mean, we, we marked a lot, of, a lot of artifacts in there. We didn't take everything. We just took enough to be able to prove that we were onto something. As soon as we were convinced, the three of us, uh, if we were treasure hunters, what we would have done is just dug all the buttons and musket balls and everything up and put them on eBay, right? That's what these guys do. Uh, that wasn't our goal. Our goal was to find somebody uh, who could help us um, go circumvent the county's um, plan. And the county's plan was, was pretty simple. What they wanted to do with that park, um, which was named Riverbend Park, and Riverbend Park actually was the name of the trailer park that was there before. Um, and they had cleared out all the trailers and um, they kept the name of the trailer park, which seemed kind of crazy. <laughs> but anyhow, um, th what the county wanted to do and what the county needed to do to um, help the developers in the area was they needed to produce what's called um, recreational concurrency. Um, concurrency in order to develop West Jupiter, in order to develop a thousand new homes out there, there's there are several things that need to be in place before the state will allow them to um, proceed with the permitting process, and and that can, those concurrency laws are what actually saved us. Now they the developers needed what was called recreational concurrency. It means if you're going to build a thousand houses, you, you've got to provide some type of rec recreational resources um, for the people who are going to live there. But they also needed um, road concurrency, so that road had to be widened uh, from two lanes to, what is it, like six or eight lanes now. Um, it, and also they had to have fire stations and police in, in place. Um, but the bottom line for us was the developers were targeting Riverbend Park to meet their recreational concurrency needs. And had the county um, allowed them to have that, that park as a recreational, for the, to meet their recreational needs, it would have become a regional park. I don't know if you're familiar with regional parks, but regional parks have softball, football, basketball, courts, um, they have, you name it, they, it's, it's in there. Um, and so that's what was destined to happen to the Loxahatchee battlefield. And that is why it was posted. Uh, we have conclusive proof that the county was aware of the fact that they knew before we did that the battlefield was there. Um, we didn't really discover it. We, we were not really the fight because there were people within the county who knew, and I have a letter that, that actually proves that. And it was pro that letter was written two years prior to us get going in there, um, but it was a letter um, from the state archaeologist notifying the county that it's likely that that was that property was the Loxahatchee battlefield. So the battlefield really was never lost; it was just more forgotten than it was lost. Um, with that said, uh, we had found enough conclusive proof in working about uh, six to eight months. Um, six to eight months, we had found enough, enough artifacts to believe that we could make a case uh, for it being the, um, the Loxahatchee Battlefield. And it had to be a strong case because if the county, county attorney comes after us and blows us out of the water, then that becomes a regional park. And the Loxahatchee Battlefield would have never, ever been known. Um, would have never, it, it would not exist today. So our job from this point was to work, try to find a um, knowledgeable archeologist that could come up and do an uh, archeological survey. Um, we had to partner, we partnered with a gentleman, uh, Mr. Richard Prozik. Um, Mr. Prozik had worked with an archeologist in Miami. He was a uh, police officer. And we partnered with Mr. Prosick. Mr. Prosick called in an archaeologist. The archaeologist contacted us, and we went out. We worked on the first archaeological survey. Um, the letter he wrote me, this is uh, dated August 22, 1994, 
was um, Dear Steve, I would like to take a few minutes to thank you for taking the time to share with me and the archaeological teams the, art the artifacts that you uncovered at River Bend Park. I felt that in the span of several hours, your tour of the park provided us with an important sense of its artifact distribution in regard to the battle and the Seminole War related uh, events in the park. I appreciate your cooperation and any further assistance you or any acquaintance can provide. I would at some point, some future date, like to obtain some of the artifacts for publication, qual uh, publication quality photographs and to provide an exhibit and display on the Los Angeles battlefield, um, which is what I did. I want to just read one quick note and then I'm gonna, gonna wrap this up. Um, not too long ago, I got accused of stealing artifacts from the Loxanche Battlefield. I had a gentleman who went to the uh, Palm Beach County Resource Review Board and told them that um, the artifacts that I took were not conclusive, uh, conclusively proof that the battle of that they were from the Battle of Loxanche. And this gentleman stood up and uh, told a lot of, a lot of stories. But the main story and the main thing that he pointed out was that I had nothing to do with the battlefield. And I'm not up here self-promoting, but what I, what I do want to say is this. I want to read this article. It says, Bob Carr photographed the material that Steve Carr brought and then made notes uh, as Steve Carr pointed out areas in the park where the artifacts were found and Steve Carr offered the material as part of the survey. This is my quote, or this is the, what the uh, re reporter quoted. You need the artifacts more than I do. That was me speaking to Mr. Carr. Um, he told the archaeologist, Bob Carr told him to keep the material until there might be a proper, an appropriate and, and proper repository such as a, a proposed interpretive center at the park where they could be displayed. Now, with that said, the artifacts that we have here um, are all artifacts that were um, accessed prior to the county acknowledging that it was a park. After that first archeological survey, which I worked on, um, I put probably um, close to 100 hours in that survey, and I took photographs of everything that we did. Um, I took them, and Jeff was there as well. We took them to all the places that we found artifacts. The one artifact that Jeff mentioned that changed everything was this piece of grape shot, um, which uh, is right sitting right here. That is mentioned in the archaeology archaeological survey, and uh, firing grape shot. They all dropped musket balls, but firing grape shot was something that they did just in, in a battle. And that was, that was it. Of the artifacts that are up here, and I'm going to uh, end my part of the program, um, all of these artifacts I'm looking for a home for. I gave three cases of the original sets of artifacts to the, uh, Palm Beach County. Um, and as of right now, Palm Beach County cannot account for the artifacts. <laughs> um, they were sent down to Morikami Morikam Museum to be stored because they do not have a facility. I spoke with the county archaeologist Christian Davenport. I said, Chris, finally, this stuff does not belong in my garage. I want to find a home for it. And what Mr. Davenport, the county archaeologist, told me is he said, Steve, don't give it to me. He said, I work out of a cubicle. He said, that would have to go underneath my chair. I, I said, I just don't have a place to put it. And after what happened with the first donation of three cases exactly like these, he said, it's not a good idea. Um, so this is our dilemma in Palm Beach County and on the, you know, regarding the battlefield is, can we establish the battlefield uh, and perpetuate it for people to come in the future? Uh, Loxhatchee Battlefield Preservationists are the host organization. They've done a wonderful job in um, letting people know that the battle exists, but I think we have to do a lot more than that. Uh, we need an interpretive center there. Um, we need to tell these multicultural stories that come out of that battle. Um, we, I mean, there's just so much that we can learn. There's so much that we can tell our children. I work today as a volunteer at Grassy Waters Preserve 
we have four to five school buses a day coming out and learning environmental science. I can see that same amount of school buses coming to the Loxahatchee battlefield every day. It should be happening. These kids should be learning our history, but they're not. And so I'm going to stand on a soapbox and say, this is my objective. Uh, if I had a magic wand, I would put the, the wheels into motion to um, take this part to its appropriate level um, of historic preservation and also give it um, an opportunity for more people to access it, more people to understand it, and for more people to love it. It's one of the most beautiful places in Palm Beach County. I encourage you to visit. If you have any questions, Jeff and I would be more than happy to answer them now. And that's my part of the program, and I'm Steve Carr. Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't he great? He's a great speaker. Um, something else I just wanted to tell you real quick and then we can wrap it up. Um, Steve Carr and Issa Ann Bryan started the Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationist Group. So um, he is uh, one of the original co-founders of that group. Um, all my artifacts came from Fort Jupiter, which uh, I believe uh, she was a panic. And, um, that was where Fort Jupiter was, and she was like an 80-year-old 80 80 year lady, and she would come out with her metal detector, and we would all hunt together. <laughs> Most of my artifacts came from Fort Jupiter, just, just so you know. Um, in conclusion, I just want to let you to get you a list of some of the people that were in either Fort Pierce or Fort Jupiter, and it's, it's, it blows me away. Um, first, Joseph E. Johnston. Um, he was the uh, commanding general of the Confederate Army. All you Civil War buffs probably know who he is. A.P. Hill, another Civil War general. William Tecumseh Sherman, um, who uh, destroyed the, <laughs> from Atlanta to Savannah. Um, Abbott Doubleday, who helped create ba the, the game baseball. Jubal Early, another Civil War general. Robert Anderson, who was the uh, commanding officer at Fort Sumter. Uh, Braxton, Braxton Bragg. <laughs> who was the uh, Confederate general who helped the uh, Confederacy lose the war, <laughs> personal opinion. Um, and uh, Major General Thomas Sidney Jessup, uh, his wife was a niece to William Clark of uh, Lewis and Clark fame. So they were, um, and um, Sam Cole was down there too. He came down and um, tested his revolving rifle, which was uh, the, up, until, up until Cole came along, all the rifles were single shot muzzle loaders and uh, he came he came and tested that his Colt revolving rifle which was a breech loading rifle. So there's a and we were finding these bullets down there at Augury Lake's property in Appendix Point. So um, anyway we're well, grateful that you came mm -hmm. today. Um, thank you so much because I know all of you love history and uh, so do we and thank you very much for coming. Now we'll take some questions. I don't know how much time we have. Alice how much how much time do we have? We have to be out by Oh, we have another hour? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what time it is. But, but. 8 8 8 8 8 8 8 Jeff, can I throw one thing? I want to throw one thing that I didn't get to say. Uh, and I wanted to just, this is very quick. Um, believe it or not, this is an original copy. This just came out of the Seminole Museum. It was on loan there for two years. We'll be going back. Um, I own it. But it's a letter uh, from the Secretary of War on expenditures to fight the Indians in Florida. Um, and I want to direct you to page uh, 10. And on the bottom of page 10, um, there is, uh, these are the expenditures for fighting the Seminole Wars in Florida. Um, at the bottom of the page, um, 59, 59 persons received 1000 Five hundred sixty-nine dollars and forty-seven forty cents for the capture and destruction of fifty-seven Indians. Uh, sundry persons received a hundred for bringing in Tampa Bay five Seminole Indians. Sundry persons re uh, received fifty dollars each for bringing into Tampa Bay twelve hostile Indians. Sundry persons they don't want to mention their name uh, for bringing a body. An Indian body into Fort Brooke received forty-five dollars. What is this telling you? They were paying bounty hunters to kill Seminoles. 
to kill Seminoles. They're paying bounty hunters. Here's the document that proved it. Um, with that said, this again, this war was less about patriotism and more about American expansion. Um, you, you, you know, I hate to go back in history and then pick people apart, but I'm not going to mention his name, but if you have a $20 bill, you can... Here he is. But he seemed to have a God complex. And when I say a God complex, that means just control everybody and control people. And, and, and it doesn't matter who he kills, who he hurts, who... And, you know, this is a lesson that we need to continuously revisit. I mean, the American government is paying people to murder Seminole Indians. And let me say something. Where these people are murdered, they were on their own property. Because the Treaty of Moultrie Creek, the Treaty of Payne's Landing, the Treaty, uh, the first three treaties with the Seminoles gave them the right to live in Florida forever. It wasn't until the Treaty of Fort Gibson, where they got a bunch of sub-chiefs drunk, took them out and showed them a million acres um, out west in Arkansas and says, oh, this is going to be your land, a million acres. They didn't tell them they were going to be sharing it with the Creek, which were their arch enemies, and they killed each other before the Second Seminole War. The Seminoles and the Miccosukees had fought the, the Creeks to, I mean, on a daily basis. So this is where Jackson is putting them. <coughs> He's going to put them on the same reservation as their arch enemies. So I just want you to look into this and say, ask yourself, where were we? I don't fault the American soldier. I was an American soldier, and I did what my government asked me to do. And I, honest to God, I didn't like what I did. Um, I wish I could take every minute of it back, but I did my duty. Um, and in the same case, I think we have to extend that to the soldiers who fought in the Second Seminole War. We have to challenge ourselves. You know, we have to always open our mind to say, are, are we doing the right thing? And uh, in this case, clearly, this war um, was not an honorable war, and it wasn't. That's why I think it escapes so much history. But I think it's that, more than anything, is the reason why we need to remember it and to promote it um, so that we don't have to repeat it. I'm off my soapbox now, but I just want to share that with you. Any questions about um, about anything up here? Yes, sir. You told us it's a beautiful area and we should visit, but I'm not clear. How do you get there from here? South. Follow the signs. <laughs> um, when you get off of uh, either I-95 or the Turnpike, um, you want to get uh, get off and go west. And it's just a short distance off on your left hand side is the uh, entrance to what it's confusing because you think you're going to be pulling into a battlefield park you're actually pulling into what's called river bend park the old trailer park name we tried we fought dearly to get that whole park you know um, named for the loxatchee battle but we lost that we did gain 65 acres of, of uh, uh, permanent trust um, but we did not gain the, uh, the name Loxatchee Battlefield. So Loxatchee Battlefield shares the title of Urban Steve, yes. See, we, we just fixed that this year, so there is a nice sign That's out in big. front that says Riverbend Park, as big as and it says right underneath Loxatchee River Battlefield Park. Big, white, beautiful letters. So well, that's the good. That is that, that's the good news because that's something that we had fought for a long time. I had originally hoped when we were negotiating a name that we would get the whole 686 acres would be designated the Loxahatchee River Battlefield Park, and that wasn't going to happen because the county still had, and even after the battlefield was noted, logged, and um, state filed, and I got a historic uh, uh, federal historic. Plan. Even after that, the county brought in um, land stewardship. Was it land, you know, Joel and Lysinger? Mm -hmm. They brought in a, uh, a, a person to do the planning for the park. And um, one of our moles intercepted the plan. And on the plan was um, a uh, 160 um, unit, <coughs> Glenn Bagel's telling me, 160 campsite campsites yeah. for 
160 camp. For motorhomes. Motorhomes, thank you. Um, if you've ever been through the park, they have this massively built bridge, and this, this bridge is huge. And the county kept saying, well, this is so people can bring their canoes over the locks and hatches <laughs> river and launch them. They paid millions and millions of dollars for this bridge, and we're telling them, well, I don't think so. Why are you going to pay $10 million for a bridge to launch canoes? Something's not going on. Well, the bottom line was that bridge was built to support motorhomes going in and out of there. Um, so we, we kind of we fought that because where they were going to place the campers was directly into the center of what today is the 65 acres that we were guaranteed um, uh, you know, at, to be named the Loxatchee Battlefield Park. So we had to fight that, and that was a big that was a big time battle. Unfortunately, we got Commissioner Coons and Commissioner Marcus on our, on our side, and they they fought for us on that. And we ended up winning. There's about five of us who went out there. We said we're going to stand here. If you're going to build um, for the cement things for the uh, camper parking, we're going to be right here when you do it. Glenn, you were there, brother. You were right there with me. Thank God. That's, that's one of the men who stopped that development. They also had a uh, motocross, a motocross track scheduled in there. <laughs> a motocross track, pretty much everything um, you can imagine. Yeah, foot, yeah, football fields, soccer fields, parking lots for 600 cars. Um, park right on the battlefield. Yes, ma'am. I see your hand. I, I went on your website. I'm assuming it's your website, and you have a reenactment coming up. I'm going to defer that because we have, we're fortunate enough to have members of Loxatchee Battlefield Preservation. Hey, how about standing up? All the members of Loxatchee Battlefield Preservation, would you please stand up? Because these are your keepers of history in the Loxatchee Battlefield. <laughs> they're the ones doing the happy birthday right now. So uh, they're the ones we need to thank. January 27th, we will have our second reenactment. That's a Saturday, not too far away. Come join us, 10 in the morning until uh, 4 in the afternoon. It's a good way to learn history. It's a really a lot of way to have fun. So, so yeah, Steve, yes, can, can we uh, tell the folks about the Black Seminole program next weekend on Monday? Yeah. You just did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. The uh, artifacts that you're, find, you're trying to retain and they found out that you couldn't trust to leave them with the county government down there. <laughs> Could any, uh, anyone in the university system, state university system, help you with the cataloging and retention well, of those? You know, I, I hate to lose local, um, mm -hmm. a local connection to these because what we have here, and I'm going to lift this up. This, everybody's looking at this. Why are you bringing a old piece of wood? This piece of wood has 14 musket balls in it from the Battle of Loxahatchee. It's the most definitive artifact I have ever seen on any battlefield. There are nine bullets visible, but there are 14 in that little section. Um, and the only thing I really, the, my number one comment when I first saw this was, God, that poor Seminole <laughs> was behind this thing. Apparently he got company fire or even regimental fire, I don't know, but they were all firing at this thing. Um, and there are guesses that this may have been a canoe uh, it may have been a canoe. It may have been a, a cypress tree that was down on a side that they were using for cover to protect against the crossing there. Lots of possibilities. The one thing we do know is that this wood was dead when the bullets went in it um, because it didn't grow, grow back over. Um, this, was, this came out of the dredge pile um, when they were rebuilding the bridge um, over the Loxahatchee. We were fortunate enough to get, I didn't find, find this. I would love to stand here and tell you, I found this. I'm the guy, me, 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 wasn't me. Um, we were fortunate enough, um, one of the people that was working um, when the dredge pile was being put, produced there from the, from the bridge was smart enough to get in there with the metal detector and he recovered an amazing amount of artifacts. Um, he since has become very, very ill. I'm not sure that he hasn't even passed away by now. But he sent them back to me because he didn't know where to send them. I want to find a home for this artifact. This is, this is resting in my garage today. It doesn't need to be in my garage. It needs to find a permanent home where it can tell the incredible story that, um, that, that is certainly um, locked inside it. The other artifacts in here, are there some very specific artifacts. Um, the ones, uh, we have uh, naval buttons here from Powell's Battle. 
That's how we proved we were on Powell's battlefield. When we found the naval button, why would we find naval buttons on a, uh, uh, on a military site unless there were naval people there? Um, the uh, artifact that Robert Carr said was the most um, definitive artifact, which is um, the grape shop, we actually found three of those. Um, Jeff has one, I have one, I gave one to the county and that has since gone. I guess it got thrown back in the river, I'm not sure. Uh, they, they, as of right now, the county archaeologists cannot locate it. It's not saying it's not somewhere, but it's, it's yeah, not known. No. Uh, other questions? Is sure. the river been part where the tribe actually lived? No, it wasn't. They, they, uh, but that's a, that's a really good question. Um, as the Seminoles were being pushed down uh, through Florida, uh, after the Battle of Okeechobee, the Battle of Okeechobee was a disaster for the alliance between the Miccosukees and the Seminoles because they were an alliance. They were a strong, tight alliance. Um, the Miccosukees, as Jeff alluded to, followed Sam Jones further south. The Seminoles, um, after this, dis this absolutely destructive battle, of the uh, Battle of Okeechobee, they went to the east. And there were a lot of theories about why did they go to the east and how would they know to, that the Loxahatchee River was east? Because the Seminoles had never been down here. It's not likely they had maps. And even if they did have maps, it probably wouldn't show the Loxahatchee River. Um, and the answer to this all comes in the black Seminoles who were allied to them. Because we have now strong evidence to prove that in the area of Jupiter, there was an escape route uh, for the Underground Railroad that was known to, to African Americans. They would come to Jupiter, um, and that when they would come to Jupiter, twice a year, under the moon, or under the, the uh, when Jupiter was at its strongest, um, and you could actually see Jupiter, boats would come from the Bahamas. They would come from Andros in the Bahamas, and they would pick up runaway slaves. I shouldn't say runaway slaves, I hate that term. Runaway African Americans who had escaped plantations. So it's likely that 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 oral tradition was known to the um, African Americans that were fighting with the Seminoles, and it's likely they brought um, they brought the Seminole body to the the the, um, the Loxahatchee River. At that point, um, you know, they just did what they could do, which was to try to hide out and hope that they wouldn't be found. Um, but the United States Army is very, very good at what they do. They always have been. Uh, it didn't take long for um, General Jessup, who was stationed at Fort Pierce. Anybody heard of that town? Mm -hmm. uh, stationed at Fort Pierce to send a river Rhine warfare unit, that would be like a marine warfare kind of unit, to go down the rivers and start looking. That's when they located them on January 15th, uh, 1838. They located the main body of the Seminoles. That battle developed the numbers of Seminoles. That information went back, and of course, the rest tells me no history. Anybody else? Question? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the Wellington Mound, and then you said Big Big Lisa Mound. Is that like the old maps of Palm Beach County? You always would have the mound. Is uh, that it? Yeah. Did well, you, you know, the old topographical maps um, would show, the new topographical maps don't show Native American mounds. And, um, but Native American mounds, and we're spe not speaking of Seminole uh, or Miccosukee. This one has been huge. Has it, it, it was. It was, a, it was an extensive mound. It was over 60 feet high at one point. And that's the one you were referring to in Wellington? That's yes. That yes. That, and that mound no longer exists. It was used to uh, reinforce the golf course at the uh, Banks Trail. Um, uh, they allowed uh, amateur archaeologists like myself um, two weeks before the power came in, and then they were developing the golf course. But that mound was on a series of mounds that aligns to the Boynton Mound Complex uh, and to Big Mound City um, out in, uh, west of West Palm Beach uh, in the Corbett area. But those mounds were mounds built by the ancient uh, Americans four to 6,000 years ago. Linda, am I right or am I wrong? I think you're right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Checks in the mail. <laughs> um, but that mound in Wellington, that's the place where they, they the, uh, after the Battle of Loxahatchee, many of the Seminoles fled south 
Um, they had lost virtually everything, all their food, um, weapons, ammunition. They fled south. And they camped on that mound. That mound we would call today, it's been referred to by many soldiers as Camp Truce, uh, because that's where they forged the truce. They negotiated with the Seminoles there. They brought in, uh, Glenn, tell me, 600, roughly? Six to 700. Six, 700. Yeah. From, from Camp Truce, they moved them to, to the newly constructed uh, Fort Jupiter. From Fort Jupiter, they awaited um, a letter that uh, Thomas Sidney Jessup had sent to Secretary of War Joel Poinsett. The letter was pleading with, with the Secretary of War to allow the Seminoles to stay in Florida and let's just end this war. There's nothing here that any anybody could ever want. Um, and the Seminoles are perfectly happy to stay here and not cause any trouble. Um, that letter went, um, was, went unheeded and Secretary of War ordered General Jessup to proceed with the war and to ship those people uh, to west, the, um, to Fort, the Fort Gibson area, and that's exactly what he did. They went over to Fort Brooke, uh, which was the present day town of Tampa. From Fort Brooke, they went by steamer across to New Orleans. By the time they got out to uh, Fort Gibson, uh, 77 of them had died. Many of them had smallpox. Um, let me finish this by saying this was a holocaust. I'd just like to give them time to take a look at the facts that you have. That's, that's okay. This was, this was a Holocaust percentage-wise for the Seminoles and Miccosukees five times greater than, the, than what the uh, Jews suffered during World War II. Percentage-wise, we had set roughly 7,000 Seminoles. When, this, when the dust cleared and everything was over, um, probably less than 500 survived. And only 150 here in Florida, the rest out in, in uh, the Indian Territory where many died from smallpox. So it, it was a Holocaust. I'll finish there. If you all would like to come up and take a look at the artifacts, if you have There's questions. one other thing. Um, you can come up while he's talking. There's, um, we found concrete rockets, which they're using to signal, and we have some of them up here. It's possible.